Uh, so we get maybe just a gentle start to the conversation, uh, Karen. I mean, uh, thanks for accepting the invitation. If I can explain for anyone not familiar with the, the term Tumblr or Tumblr school, uh, Tumblr is a Yiddish word, uh, which means someone who's hired to get a party going. Uh, so you can imagine the scene of a, uh, a room, a party with the music, the dance floor, the people, the drinks, the food, but no one's dancing. And the idea of the tumbler is to really sort of get among the crowd and encourage the crowd, nudge the crowd, get them onto the dance floor and um, you know, li literally get the party going. And we think that's a great analogy for really a role in community development and uh, uh, community activism and uh, community transformation that um, really uh, there's often a willingness to have a party, the, the resources around, but you need that spark, that inspiration, and that also that sort of a leader to to in, um, encourage leaderfulness in other people. So, you know, the party still goes after they've long gone, uh, but they've been the spark to get the party going. So in our series of monthly uh, meets, we've had, met some wonderful people across Wales who are looking to transform community. And I say today we welcome Karen from Purple Shoots. So really to begin there, Karen, I mean, um, uh, would you explain a bit more about what does what is purple shoots what it does and uh, how is it different from sort of uh, other ways of um, community involvement the schemes that help people in the community okay so purple shoots is, has been going for about eight years um uh, i set it up um really because i've come out of the financial services industry and saw a lot of people left behind who weren't supported by anybody who had good business ideas and good potential but couldn't realize it because they couldn't raise the funding to get businesses off the ground so purple shoots was set up as a as a classic microfinance organization which means that we lend very small amounts of money to individuals to enable them to get a business off the ground um, and those people are people that typically nobody else will fund so uh, so that's the main thing we do and then the other thing we do which is sort of related to it is is um, what we call self-reliant groups which are groups of which are collectives really people who haven't quite made it as far as thinking they can start a business but have still got potential to do something either together or within the community or maybe to move towards starting a business but maybe need need a sort of a network around them to get there and that's what the self-reliant groups provides so that's the the, the two things that purple shoots does yeah. so what's the problem then i mean i'm sure you won't find like, certainly anyone in government saying we need to help people get encourage them to be more entrepreneurial self-reliant and uh, creating businesses and creating jobs and the banks are out there to in the business of lending money so uh, what are the problems that are getting in the way of um, the people you uh, you 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 help out there so the people we help are sort of at the bottom of the economic pile if you want to put it that way i suppose the people who the banks can't help because um or uh, banks on the whole don't do don't, are not very interested in doing really small loans um they're expensive to do i can understand why um, and they certainly won't help somebody who maybe has a poor credit score but if you've been out of work for a little while or if you've been say a carer for somebody and not working or you've had a, a, an illness that's kept you out of work you you, you would have been on dependent on benefits and the spiral down into poverty from from that is really quick and if you've had a job and then you lose it then you've got commitments that you might not be able to meet so then you start getting defaults on your credit score so lots of people who were on benefits have got a bad credit score and that's the thing that stops them um, raising money from anywhere else so even the government startup loan schemes won't help somebody with a poor credit score but our experience tells us that those people are still capable of running a good business um, and, and you've just got to sort of I don't know ignore the typical uh, rules of lending not completely ignore but to, 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 to go beyond those to help them to build a business. It's interesting you say that the uh, banks, as I say, um, may be operating to strict business criteria, and yet government is there to, uh, in a much broader um, remit, and uh, obviously a prime concern to help. So uh, you mentioned there about the, the, the poor credit scores as one sort of criteria, but is that is there more that could be done, or is there indeed a, a need for a new mindset or new approach from government and others out there who are ostensibly out there to support these very people there is a need for a change of mindset there is definitely that there's a they and the covid um crisis really exposed it because 
they put the governments, both Welsh and national, put out lots of help packages for businesses, but they completely overlooked the, the sole traders uh, who were the tiniest businesses. So if they didn't have a premises, you know, if they were mobile, like I don't know, a gardener, a plaster, all sorts of people don't have premises. They just didn't qualify for anything. And, the, um, and certainly the ones who hadn't been self-employed for very long didn't get much out of a self-employed thing. I just think overall, there's a, the, the, the governments don't value the very small businesses, even though they make up most of the businesses in our economy, sort of 99% of them are small and form a huge percentage of the employment um, that's out there. They just don't value them enough. They, so they don't value small business and they also, um, there's also a, very, a prevailing very negative attitude towards people who are on benefits. So um, the, the idea, the, the, the attitude is that they're somehow lazy or scroungers, work shy, um, or their parents with hundreds of children. I mean, and there's been research that demonstrates that that just isn't so, but that our attitude is still out there. So they, the people who find themselves, you know, wanting to start a business with skills that they can use, but, you know, a bad credit score and no money to put in, they've, they've not only got to overcome the sort of reluctance of the financial institutions to support them, but this attitude as well, which is very negative. Um, yeah. well, I, bet, so I bet you must come across some really sort of inspiring people uh, with great opportunities, great, you know, uh, store, you know, uh, a great desire to do something. Um, any, any examples you want to share of like the sort of people, uh, the type of people you help? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm always sort of humbled by the, um, the resilience of the people that we work with, because they've often had knockback after knockback. Something awful has happened in the first place, often, to put them in the difficult position they're in. And then they keep tr they try to make things better, and they, they get pushed back all the time. So by the time they get to us, a lot of them are, are, are you know, we're the last resort, and they, they're not even expecting us to help them. So, um, I mean, I've got loads of good stories. Maybe I should tell the story of one lady who... Um, she was a single mum. She didn't plan to be a single mum. She got left and, uh, with, a, with a child. And because of that, she couldn't, she couldn't maintain the job she was doing because of the cost of childcare. So then she became dependent on benefits. And then, then there's this spiral down into financial difficulties. But she, as a, as a mum, she had a brilliant idea for a, um, a, a, a support pillow, a series of support pillows for, for pregnant women. And um, they, it was, they were a good idea and she started to market it and she began to make a little bit of money, but she couldn't, she couldn't get beyond, she couldn't get it, she couldn't get it to the point where she could leave benefits, so she couldn't grow it. And, and, and she was in this really difficult position. She was very, she, was, she, she says now that she, she got to be suicidal because she was so in despair. She could see this opportunity, she couldn't seize it and she was struggling with money all the time. So we helped her, we lent her the money and she, it got her, got that thing marketed properly. And it's now um, manufactured, she employs people. Um, it's, it's, she's, she sold it around the UK. And on the back of that, she's also started um, a little network called the Single Mums Business Network, which um, is now a, a national, it's UK wide. And it's to, and her idea is to support other mums like her to try to help them to avoid the struggle that she went through. So it's, it's kind of had a real knock on, you know, in terms of social capital, you know, we helped her, but she's now helping a whole cohort of, of other people who are in the same position as her. So you mentioned social capital. So uh, you, it's not just the case of, uh, yes, you're more um, available to lend money. You go beyond it. You mentioned earlier about the uh, self-reliant groups. I mean, how do they work? What's, what's the story now? So those are based on um, on groups that, that are very common in the third world, um, where where you'll get a little a village a, a village say, and, and all the women in the village will group together, all the men in the village will group together and support each other to develop sometimes something in their community. So, for instance, I, I visited some actually uh, years ago now in India, and there was one um, village where the, the women had got together and formed a little group, and the first thing they did was make the government. Um, tarmac the road to their village so that they could get products in and out you know they sort of did that sort of stuff and then they, they also put pressure on to get a teacher in their school because they had a school building but the teachers didn't turn up then they turned their attention to well what could we do and so then they started a they started a little business with silkworms and and they they, they grow silkworms and harvest the silk so that's a little business that supports all of them and they very proudly showed us when we visited the the, the houses that they'd improved with the money and so on so it, it's that idea that we've sort of stolen to implement in, oh, in I Wales. think shared and uh, so what sort of things do your self-reliant groups do here in the UK and here in Wales 
so there's a there's a mix of them so we, we there's some do we've got a, a few that do pop-up cafes um some of those have got a mixed people with additional needs as well as able-bodied which is great very in inclusive we've got some that just do straightforward crafts some that do woodworky stuff we have one group that was um they, they all had different skills in the wedding industry so they were there was a seamstress a florist um a, a designer and they all got together and uh, they, they individually sort of kept their businesses going, but together they offered ethical weddings. So, um, uh, so the, the, you know, uh, it was a very clever idea. Um, I think that's that's not happening at the minute because COVID mucked it up, but hopefully that will restart. Mm -hmm. But they, so there's a big range of things. Sometimes the groups are just support groups. If the people are, you know, um, they just want to support each other and maybe do stuff for other people in the community and not work towards the business, that's fine. It, it, it's a real mix of what people choose to do. Do, do these groups groups go beyond like, not just uh, uh, like, um, different specialist jobs, but is there a dividend from being as part of a group? So, well, yes. I mean, there's a there's a certainly a support network. So it's a friendship group. It's a it's a support group. So they they usually we encourage them to sort of set up a savings pot. So they put money in every week to a little pot, and then that gives them choices. Then they can either use it to all go out on a trip or something together, or they can invest it in, in whatever they want, whatever they might want to try out in, in business terms. And or they could lend it to each other if somebody's in, in a crisis. So um, they can, you know, support each other that way. And we've, we've, we've found, I think, we, I don't know how we managed to arrive at this figure, but we, it was when we were doing an evaluation that each group has a positive impact on 35 other people, <laughs> roughly. So it's sort of their friends and family, their neighbours or whoever it is that they're working amongst. So it has a, a dividend that way too. You mentioned evaluation there. So uh, there's one criteria, say banks use and, and so on. And you mentioned that government focus. On. What sort of criteria then would you think uh, would be helpful to get us out of this uh, log jam, it seems, of people who need help? There's resource, there's uh, uh, potential funds and so on. But what, what sort of criteria, what sort of framework of measurement or something do you think is needed to go forward to change things? I don't know whether it I don't know whether it's measurement or whether it's attitude. I mean, at the minute, we're updating some of the data that proves how beneficial our lending is to the economy. Because it's it's the, the data that I've been using is quite old. It's about, I don't know, six or seven years old. So we're trying to update it. But it demonstrates that for every one pound that, for instance, that we lend in the economy, there's a net gain to Treasury of three or four pounds in terms of benefits, say, taxes paid, money spent in the economy. So it's a really in government terms, it, it, you know, why would you not want to put money into this? <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a few things from our point of view that we want government to do to, to help us grow what we do. Um, but, a, but a lot of the other stuff is around attitude. It's around um, trusting, believing in the people that are out there in the community, that, that they know what to do and, and being prepared to back them. I, I, um, they talk about it a lot, but I think when it comes to it, they struggle to trust people. Um, yeah, that's it. so um, in terms of attitude, then you mentioned about how you spent time in India. I mean, let's a bit more about yourself. What makes you a more trusting person? What sort of, what's your background? I know you, you meant uh, you've previously worked as in, in the finance industry and so on. You've let's say you've been to India, so it sounds like a fascinating story. There. Do you want to tell more about yourself, there, Karen? Oh, okay. So, well, yes, I do have a, a career history, I suppose, in the financial services industry. I worked in the city originally, and I I married a Welshman and ended up in Wales, and. Uh, worked for a, a few, did a few jobs for small businesses before I then worked for um, financial institutions here. Um, and, and that, in all, in all of that, and that, that all makes sense now I'm doing Pebble Shoots, but at the time it felt like a bit of a hodgepodge career. But, um, but all of those things have been really useful uh, in fitting together to create Purple Shoots. But it, it, it um, the, the uh, oh, what's my thread now? Oh yeah, so the trips then, the, tri the, the trips we, we, I suppose I saw at the, the bottom end of the market, I was frustrated that people couldn't get um, the support that they needed um, in, through the institutions that I was working for at the time. Either the criteria, they, they, a lot of them for very small loans work on computer things. And so it just kicks people out and there's no chance for sort of discussion. And that's what frustrates a lot of people. And so I, re I knew that there were lots of people that weren't being funded and I was trying to bring them to the organizations I was working for and they were saying oh no what are you thinking we can't do these you know um so that was sort of what was driving me to start Purple Shoots um 
and I, I guess that there is a, there's a faith issue. I know you mentioned it in the write up, but I, I'm also a Christian and believe that Christians have got a responsibility to do something about injustice and and, think, and poverty that they see right in front of them. So that's a big driver for me. Um, but I, I I discovered that the Grameen Bank, which is the archetypal microfinance institution, was setting up in Scotland at about the same time as I set up Purple Shoots. And I went up there and met them. That didn't go anywhere. But whilst I was up there, I met somebody else who runs a small charity now called Weevolution. And he's the one that invited me to a trip to India um, to visit the self-help groups out there. So we, I had I went with a, a few other charities. He took a group of us out there and we visited rural ones and we visited um, urban ones. Um, and some of those I still want to replicate the one I saw in Mumbai, which was um a, a small factory that was manufacturing clothes that I recognised, you know, that, that's a brand that I've seen in the UK, but they were, a lot of the work making them was done by little self-help groups out in the slums. And they, the way they did it was to say, well, we need to make, you know, 50, 50 or 500 skirts. Who, who's got capacity? And the groups would say, we'll do 100. And they were all paid properly. And, and that's the sort of thing I wanted to try to replicate here. Um, but, and that, and that very I, encounter, that was an example of social capital in action, like meeting somebody um, and then through those relationships, through those networks and contacts, positive things emerge. So, again, a, right. a wonderful example there of uh, just making connections, being here today and so on. Uh, Margaret, you've got your hand up there. Is there something you'd like to say to say? Please chip in then. And, and, and anyone, please, this is a, uh, an open discussion. There. So, Margaret, please do join in. Hi, hi, Evan. Hi, Karen. I was just interested to know if you've seen the types of groups that um, get in touch with you and that you work with, whether there has been a change in the types of businesses um, over the time that you've been doing it, especially in light of all the emphasis um, with the COP26 and more emphasis on the climate and environment, um, whether you've seen any changes. There's a, there has been a, certainly a lot more, I mean, I don't know whether it's to do with climate or whether it's to do with thrift, but certainly a lot more um, efforts within the groups are on reusing. So, so, so we've, we've got a couple of groups that are, that are building um, I think garden furniture and things like that out of old pallets and things like that, or, or creating even nicer things than that. And we've just sold some stuff at the Christmas market that was made with sort of waste, waste wood. And, and some of the crafty groups, I suppose, are more interested in doing that sort of thing. And um, yeah, the, the, I think, I think, I, but I'm not sure, like I said, whether that's to do with making the, the, the most of what they've got, sort of taking what's in front of them, using it, or whether it's more to do with climate change. I think um, as, and amongst the small businesses, um, I, to be honest, I haven't seen much of a change, but a lot of them I think are pretty green anyway, because they tend to be very local and very, so it, and their suppliers are local. And so that they, 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 they're not, um, you know, they're not the big multinationals that sort of have lots of air miles and things like that. <laughs> uh, can we? Why, why, can we get? You mentioned Christmas markets. So any, is there any plug we could give for any forthcoming? Uh, uh, we've, we've, we were there for no. We've just left it actually. We were there for the okay. first two weeks of Carter Christmas market. So we've uh, we just we've just pulled out because it, it you can you can you can buy sections of time there and it's cheaper at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, so we, uh, always, we do the first two weeks. So but we are, so most of that any any stock that was left there is now back in our shop in Pontypridd. So people can come there and shop locally <laughs> for the stuff that our people make. Uh, so you mentioned about some in, uh, inspiring people. You mentioned like the the uh, uh, microfinance schemes in Bangladesh, and you've been around to India. Um, and any sort of change makers that inspire you that um, uh, you know keep uh, you know, keep your energy levels up by just thinking about them, and will give you ideas or inspiration. Who inspires you? So there's a few. Um... Actually, I, the, the, I also did a trip to Uganda. There's a there's a, a charity in Pontypridd called Pont, and they had some funding a few years ago uh, for to take a trip. Out. They, they partner with a charity in Uganda and do lots of support. The hospitals are partner, the schools are partner, and so on. they wanted a sort of an entrepreneurial angle. So we actually took um, five of our group members. I mean, I, I, I can't believe they went. Sometimes I struggle to get them to go as far as Cardiff, let alone Uganda. <laughs> but um, they all came, uh, five, well, five of them came. Um, and uh, I mean, they, I've got some very funny stories there. Well, I will tell you one very funny story if I've got time. Because when you arrive in these little Uganda villages, you're treated like royalty. They, they sit you on chairs and then they do a, a welcome dance, which I, well, I found very <laughs> embarrassing. And we can in Ponte uh, Brief. <laughs> yeah, and, but the women that came with me from my groups, the, 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 they, they just got up and joined in. And um, and I sort of turned to the man from Pontypridd organised. I said, does this often happen? And he said, no. 
It's sort of nervously. <laughs> but but what it did was it broke down the barriers between the two groups of women completely. It was lovely. And then so then every time we went to a new place, that happened every time. And and it was that was really great. But anyway, in it, it the 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 organizations that we were visiting in Uganda were a series of very small NGOs, quite like purple shoots. So they not all they didn't they weren't doing microfinance, but they were doing the, the groups. Um, and I remember sitting in a meeting with all of them, and we were discussing resources. And I think at the time I was very stressed about not being able to raise enough money for all the demand that was out there for purple shoots. And we were just talking generally about that. And and one of the um one of the women um from this organization, she said, Oh, we just take the little we have and we build. And I just thought that, that was so powerful for me to sort of take, right, uh, uh, stop worrying about what you haven't got, look at what you've got and work with that. And I often go back to that conversation if I if I find myself worrying about, you know, raising money for the future. So certainly those and, and those people in Uganda had so little, much less than me to work with, and they were still achieving great things. So that they're an inspiration. Yeah. And that also shows the power of humility, doesn't it, in terms of uh, inspiring and going forward. Then, uh, just really one or two more questions before we wrap up and open up to the floor. There. Um, so, is this, is if there's one thing you've been most proud of, well, what would would you share there? What do you think? It's really difficult to pick on one thing. I mean, I, I'm I, I, because I, I'm so I'm really proud of so many of the people who have made it. You know, who've made it, and and you know, all we did was remove the last barrier which was the access to finance. And then they've just flourished and created something really good. And I suppose I'm I'm proud of that. Sometimes I, if I drive down a street, um, uh, there's, one, there's a street in Cardiff where there's two or three businesses we funded. And there's another one in Port Talbot where there's a couple that we funded. And and, and I'm sort of looking, oh, that was us. That was, you know, uh, that that's a moment of pride, I suppose, that, that we've been able to change things like that. Yeah. Great. Oh, well, um, every guest at Tumblr School, we always ask this question that um, uh, if you had one minute with the First Minister, Mark Drayford, uh, what is the big change you would ask for? So I would try to resist saying, give me more money, give me money. But uh, <laughs> that's what I'd like to say. <laughs> but I, I think it's I think it's around um, what I talked about earlier, around attitude, around being prepared to trust and support and um, the people who are who they see as disadvantaged because they're poor and, 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 they, and all they see is the disadvantage and the struggle and they don't see the powerful people that are behind that and the, the people, the resourceful people that are behind that. And I would, would like them to see that. And, and he might, but what they do indicates that they don't, you know, they treat them like helpless people that have got to have training and help. And actually sometimes all they need is a little bit of money for a sewing machine, a, a van, and that's it. They're fine then, you know, and because they know how to do everything else. So it, it's that uh, attitude change I think I would ask him for. Maybe we'd uh, let's say put out a call for an invitation to like visit some of your your, your uh, the people you work with there, and hopefully, as I say, get less change of attitude there going forward. Massive thanks, there, Karen. Uh, can I open up? I mean, as I say, I'm... pleasure speaking about it. Uh, um, anyone else want to sort of have uh, entered a conversation here? Because I think there's lots of fascinating starting points and uh, points to develop or explore there. Uh, anyone else like to join in the conversation here? Uh, Matt, hello, Matt. How are you, Matt? Hi. Um, thanks for that talk. It was uh, uh, really kind of fascinating. The, the, the thing that resonated really with me right at the end there was, was that... Um, the idea of just removing the last barrier. And I'm just wondering if, if you can think, you know, are there, are there other areas um, where that, you know, where, where this sort of approach could really make a difference to people, just kind of moving that last, removing that last hurdle that, that people face to, uh, to get a good idea or a good initiative off the ground? Yeah, uh, uh, do you mean, uh, I mean geographically? Certainly. <laughs> I mean, our, our plan is to expand around the UK where we are starting one in Yorkshire, not inadequately funded, but I'm going for it. Um, <laughs> um, so I think I think there's that need is, is everywhere in terms of people with who are resourceful and have got skills um, and, and, and just need a bit of money to get started. Um, that I think that's I think that's everywhere. Um, in terms of other things that hold people back, um, the benefit system is an, is an issue because um, it it uh, you all you probably all know about the tapering away of benefits, but uh, and, and I know they've improved that. But they haven't proved, improved it nearly enough. So if you if you move into self-employment and you um you 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 start to earn money, most of the money disappears again because they knock it off your benefits. So that's that's a problem. Um, and and then the other issue is around people who are on 
the disability benefits where they're allowed to earn money, but it often triggers a review. So these things are, are, are put people off trying, mm. put people off test trading, put people off working because they're afraid of, of losing. So, so that's a hurdle that could be improved and, and could make it much easier for people to try things um, and, and, to, and to, try, you know, to try and fail and try again. Because if you try and fail and you've left your benefits, you know, then it takes it's a fight to get it back. So that's another thing that could maybe be changed. And I thought, uh, I say, uh, join the conversation. Uh, Rob, hello, mate. How are you? Good to yeah, see you. Good. good. Um, I'm going to lower that. Um, one of the things that struck me, it was really, you know, fascinating to to hear the description. And I think the, uh, the idea of breaking down barriers is really, really a, a, a difficult thing to do in practice. And, and, Often it's around the kind of language that we use and the expectations about as a business administrator, there's a kind of middle class language, uh, whereas, uh, as you say, kind of people, I, I don't know, again, I don't know the right language for this, but kind of ordinary people don't have talk about KPIs and uh, business planning and, and those kind of things. And actually, whose responsibility is that to... Uh, to 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 break those barriers down, is is it the responsibility of people living their daily lives in their communities, or is it the the business managers to take a look at themselves and say, you, you know what, we're wrapped up in our own terminology here, and we need to get out of that and kind of because, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's another factor I suppose in terms of uh, our financial system. The bigger picture is that it you know moved away from small local finance back in the 1980s towards the kind of, you know, the monetarist policies, which kind of centralized all, all of the kind of finance around Canary Wharf. So you can't walk into your local bank. It's very difficult to get local uh, uh, trusted finances. You don't have the same relationship with your bank managers anymore. They're working to scripts, but also people don't live they, they live in segregated communities or separate communities. So they're not living in the same place. They don't have the same accents and they don't talk in the same way. And that creates a, a bubble around each, I suppose. You're, you're absolutely right about language. I mean, that's partly why we're called purple shoots and not, you know, enterprise finance or something like that, because we, we didn't want anything to put people off. And we've agonized over the language on our website because it's appealing to quite a wide, um, group of people so you don't want to be patronizing you know the people we work with don't think that they're disadvantaged or in poverty or any of those things so you can't say that and uh but but a lot of people are very unfamiliar with the most um what we would think was the most basic business language or the most basic financial language and and that that is a barrier because it puts people off and even some of our processes you know sort of it, for our groups for instance you know to to open a bank account they need a constitution and we're trying to keep the groups informal and uh, keep them away from some of this stuff that puts them off. But they've got to have a constitution if they want to open a bank account. So, you know, it, it, uh, and that's a very middle class thing that we've sort of imposed on people that, that um, isn't helpful uh, and, 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 and doesn't. And I think maybe stifles some of the some of the innovation that's in there because because we make it too we, we, we kind of with our language, we make it too difficult. And I, I mean, I think it's probably down to, to, to the business managers, the, 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 the business advisors to try to bridge that gap. I don't know who else would do it. I think we added a new word to the English language, a middle castness is, <laughs> is a verb or something. Uh, Margarita. Karen, do you work with people like um, the Wales Cooperative um, who do provide um, some of the services we're talking about to bridge that gap? Yes, yes, we do a bit. Yeah, and with Business Wales. Um, yeah, yeah, with, with all of those. Um, with all of those guys, yes, if, if they can, they uh, yes, we do. Uh, they often refer to us where, when they've been working with somebody who then needs finance or, or needs the next step. Mm -hmm. uh, Liz, I live in the room. Uh, how, how, you, how are you today? Uh, is there anything you'd like to sort of comment upon? As I say, it's been a fascinating conversation here. I appreciate the connection can be a bit bad at times. Yeah. <laughs> the sincere apologies there. I mean, the connections, 
very very bad and uh, so uh, apologies there but please put in the chat if there's any particular you'd like to ask there in, in terms going forward um and uh, if i could just maybe just comment about this middle class so uh, i suppose one of the problems is people don't appreciate you know that they're speaking that language and um uh, it's uh, uh, has barriers in itself uh, as i say because often you find most well-meaning of people most well-intended and yet as you say they're um, unconsciously um, putting these sort of types of barriers up there i mean uh, uh, and i'm a, a, obviously a great reader i mean um uh, i was a great fan of the book poverty safari which i'd recommend anyone as you know sort of a giving an insight there and um um, and I know the Victorians, and we look back and criticise them because uh, I know from the East End of London that there, there were like poverty tourism and going on. But, but in some ways, actually, at least they, they, they sort of rec did a bit of outreach, whereas we're finding mo most of us living in these sort of in bubbles of diminishing uh, people like us. So I'm just wondering, what, is there any sort of practical things we could do there, you think, Karen, from your experience? <laughs> Hmm. I mean, certainly the certainly the groups that we do tend to bridge that gap a little bit, you know, um, getting to, because you you, could, you do get more of a mix in those groups of different. But it is, I agree, it's difficult, and the bubbles sort of self perpetuate almost, you know, and uh, and, and breaking that down is is important because that would encourage understanding between different groups of people as well. We do yeah. with our with our groups. We try and get all the groups together every now and then. We haven't done that for two years, but normally we try and get them all together every now and then so that they can meet each other. And then that also helps because we've we've had groups that are from um, uh, ethnic minorities, recent immigrants. We've got people with disabilities. We've got quite a mix, and then it's really nice to get all those together. You mentioned about, um, uh, ethnic minorities. Are there particular additional problems they face from your experience? Um, Actually, it, from my experience, they do better because their communities are um, seem to be better at supporting them, um, which is interesting. So we do we, we do do a few loans to people um, from ethnic minority groups, but not that many. And I think a, a lot of them get get their support from friends and family. And um, the groups, the self reliant groups, we've got a few going there, and they really understand them because they recognise them from um, from. Where, often from where, where, where their home country is and so we will start a group with them and it will become independent really quickly and won't need us anymore because they know what to do so um yeah I, I i know that's the that's an upside down way of saying it because most people say that they're more disadvantaged but from what i've seen it seems to be the other way around so i mean it's uh, what are labeled the somewhere people do you think there's this is issue i mean like uh, in uh, studies on uh, educational attainment it's like work white working class boys do the, the, so do you think there is actually a, a myopia out there about um uh, the white working class as, a, as an invisible um group that you know it, there's not uh, government agencies fail to connect with yeah i think so i think so yeah definitely but they seem to be very left behind and left out yeah, uh, Russell, you mentioned in chat about precariousness there. I mean, anything you want to uh, talk about that or anything else? Well, no, it, it was, I mean, put my hand up, it was this sense that what Rob was getting at with his question, what Karen's referred to around this language, and not necessarily, uh, or not specifically in a, uh, a financial context, this work we've been doing this last few months around resilience in the voluntary sector in Wales, there's, there's, there's similar themes that came out of this sense that this, you know, what do people mean by resilience? Do they do they mean something else? Do they are they using this term in order to bring about certain sort of changes in behaviour and things like that? And the sense that again, a language gets imposed on people who are just day to day at the coalface. <clears throat> to use the hackneyed phrase, um, you know, working with people, engaging them, listening to them, uh, you know, adapting their services, and almost the sense as well things like co-production. When you break it down with them, they go. Oh, we've been doing that for a while <laughs> you know we we've been wondering that we thought you might have meant something completely different that was new and, and radical and innovative but it's actually you know, listening to people and spending time with them and responding to the, you know that kind of thing so that 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 professionalization of middle class asian whatever the, the phrase is of language i think is it's not just in finance it can be a lot across a lot of areas of, of, of work, of operation that these small groups, small businesses, social enterprises uh, and, and the rest are, are involved in. It, it resonated a lot with the work that we've been doing, which hopefully is going to be being published any, anytime soon. <clears throat> 
Uh, can I uh, bring uh, Liz is kindly in a chat uh, question about um, and, uh, about one of us about how groups manage change within the dynamics of the groups? Do they need support as people leave or join? Uh, and there's an ongoing relationship with Purple Shoot. So I don't know if you could elaborate a bit more about that, please. Yeah. So yes. So that there are what we try to do early on is get a sort of a group agreement going, a really simple one that says, you know, who can join? What happens if somebody leaves? What happens if there's a disagreement? What what happens with the money? Uh, some really simple things that they agree on, so that then when things change, you know, if somebody falls out, I mean, it does happen, <laughs> or um, or somebody new wants to join, then they've got some ground rules that they can refer to to, to deal with it. So and and we've and as occasionally, I mean, usually they sort it out themselves. Occasionally we've we've helped, but often it's better if they sort it out themselves. So uh, I mentioned there's some ground rules. Uh, is that something you've I mean, really, I mean, uh, it's an unposh word for constitution in some ways, but... Uh, um... <laughs> it, it is. I mean, we try, I mean, I've tried that. I said, we've got this agreement. Will that do as a constitution? But it usually, it, sometimes it does. I think it does for credit unions, but it's, it's usually only one page. But, um, but it is a bit, it's, it is, it's a very simple constitution, but it's, yeah. So could that, do you offer that as a sort of, as a model ground rules, or do you really keep the page blank? to let them come up with it because uh, uh, how do you how do you manage that, that, so we, that we dynamic? Keep the, the page is blank but we suggest the topics that they should address so one is finance you know one is disagreements one is um confidentiality is another one we, we think they should have something on and and about membership who's in who's out sort of thing so so that they've but we let them decide uh, we, we just suggest that they should tackle those things. so how do you manage it where you've got a group uh, the, and you and in some in many instances you can see well I can see like, where this is going or we've been here before. Uh, how do you balance that sort of innate instinct to sort of dip in and uh, tell them how to do it as opposed to sort of backing off? How do you manage that? Oh, that's quite difficult, and, and I wasn't very good at it to start with because I'm the sort of person that thinks, oh yeah, I can see that that can happen now, and I want to do it now, and and actually that doesn't work. You I've, you've really got to sit on your hands and and let them do it and wait and wait for them to do it and it that it that is quite that is quite um difficult and it's quite countercultural for, for certainly for caring people you know so sort of people so I, I remember actually when we when we went to uganda um one of the ladies who came um is a, a wheelchair user and um the, the woman from social services who's completely lovely and really caring took me on one side and said what do you think you're doing taking her to, to Uganda? She'll never manage. And I said, she's an adult. She's decided to come. <laughs> you know, it's nothing to do with, you know, it's not, not, certainly nothing to do with you. And, 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 and it's her decision. Um, and so, but, 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 I could, but people who are used to caring and used to doing things for people really struggle with that. So we have to be careful with our team as well as who's on our team. It's got to be somebody who's able to stand back and, and let people make mistakes as well, as well as, um, you know. so, so is there a point where you do sort of interject? I mean, uh, or you just let it go as it goes? Well, we might. I suppose we might if we can see things going hopelessly awry. But they might ask us to. But um, there's no, there's no set, there's no set point. No set. <laughs> I'm just wondering. Actually, you've got a lot of emergent knowledge, so your sort of ground rules. I think that could be a very useful asset for change makers. Uh, 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 you know, to stimulate their thinking and, and, and as a recourse, because, you know, we'll go online and uh, paste and copy, you know, sort of generic constitutions. And it just seems to me you've got some valuable learning and asset there. Is that something that could be made available? Even? Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, sort of the purple shoot, sort of emergent ground rules, brackets, what posh people call constitution close brackets. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that's been valuable there. Um, so really, I mean, just uh, uh, say wrapping up the the, the conversation, uh, uh, there's lots of inspiring thoughts and comments here. Uh, I've been reminded I've got to sort of give a, a say a, 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 a big thank you to our sponsors um, and um, particularly uh, Bank Cambria, Dupo, IndieCube, and Working Word uh, for you know their support in making this happen. And uh, really, a big thank you for everyone who's come here today to. Um, good to see you, Liz. How are you? And as uh, I um, uh, big fan, as I say, we're hanging around for a few more minutes if anyone wants to have a further chat. But really, as I say, a massive thank you to Karen uh, for 
inspiring work um, and rightful provocations about, you know, things got to change uh, and certainly give us a lot of food for thought and some practical ideas to go forward there, help us forward there. And Lizzie, if I join the room in a, in a cabinet, is there anything you'd like to further add to your question? Or is... Are we okay then? I'm, I'm really sorry that the, the internet's been dreadful up here today and I did have a previous meeting so I was a bit late getting here but um I, no it's been fascinating I, I, I'm catching up with Karen next week on another project so it's been really useful background for me but um, I understand a lot more and I just think it's inspiring stuff really so um yeah what's the project can I ask sorry what's the project you're meeting Karen about it's just a, a, bit, a bit of a nose there because uh, I'm evaluating a project she's involved in, so um, oh, yeah, great. Just... <laughs> okay. well, well, listen, guys, massive thanks for everyone joining us today and uh, really an inspiring that, um, yes, there's many things wrong in the world, but we can learn from each other and grow from each other, the power of social capital there. And uh, a big thank you to everyone for coming together today. So thank you, Dan. Thank you.